The Best Hall Building Award for Asia and Australia for 2010 went to the Pinnacle at Duxton in Singapore. And uh, it's an amazing public housing project that we're going to talk about with Lawrence Pack, who is the Deputy Director of the Singapore Housing and Development uh, Board and with the two architects of the building, Peng Beng Ku, and his wife, Belinda Huang, of uh, the Arc Studio Architecture and Urbanism. And welcome to Chicago. I'm glad to see you. This is, this is quite a building and you know we here in Chicago have had our own experiences with public housing and when you look at this building, this, uh, this is uh, seven 55-story buildings that are interconnected and uh, when you think about what this could have been with just these monolithic structures and what it turned out to be, this is an amazing piece of work. Tell us, tell us about it. Um, well, it, where shall I start? Seven, I think when we first conceived the building, we knew that you know, it had to be buildable. It had to be um, maintainable in the long run. Uh, he had to fall within a certain cost. Um, and we were starting to think about what kind of possibilities such a great number of residences coming together could yield instead of thinking of the difficulties. Um, and we thought that you know, um, every tower block would need mechanical transfer flows and every tower would need uh, water tanks and all these kind of transfers. What happened if we could collect all of these together, share them, and then the space that was um, originally thought of for mechanical spaces could now be returned to the community. And when we started thinking along those lines, we started to reclaim the roof and the mid-levels and the floors. And um, the result was that uh, parkland uh, got created up in the air where um, services used to be. And a simple idea of linking all of the towers together, I think, created a very dramatic silhouette and a dramatic urban windows that could then start to frame the city, you know. I think um, at the end of the day, we are still talking about public housing. So, I mean, before Duxton, uh, if you look at the, the palette of materials that, that we, we actually get to use is still concrete and, and bricks and, you know, um, no curtain walling because we have, to have, uh, we have to have control on the total cost and, and, and how that po building is actually portrayed to the rest of the city as well. So one of our biggest issues being a high density project is, is about um, uh, how heavy the building would look in the cityscape. So um, a lot of the, the design thinking was also put into how we can actually um, relook at a traditional facade and using the same traditional materials, really. So we went into a precast system where we had a series of modules that we, we, we could, we could um, start to place them. We string them up into almost like a musical note system, and, and, it, and, and the effect of it is almost a fabric-like um, facade. And that actually helped break down the, 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 the scale of the building itself and start to soften the entire facade. I mean, on, on top of the windows, that actually start to seemingly move in random, but I think there's some order to that as well. Uh, we had additional plug-ins as well to the facade to add on to um, the textures and complexity of the facade, like the balconies and the bay windows, the planters with its, with its railing and, 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 and um, uh, uh, canopies as well. So I think all in all, all that helped to to then um, uh, soften that that whole the whole monolithic feel of the seven blocks strung together. And these are seven fifty-five story blocks, which is uh, which was what eighteen hundred and forty-eight apartments yeah. on on a, a plot of land that's about this uh, about slightly larger than two football fields, which is amazing, and that really is high density. And what one of the things that the uh, council jury said about this was. Uh, it was just that much more amazing because this was done in the context of public housing. And Lawrence, you're the owner of this building. Um, what went into shaping this building? The area itself, what we wanted to do was to transform the area, to bring in younger group of people, to revitalize the aging population within the area itself. So 
our residents uh, have um, high demands on the type of buildings that go, in, go into that district itself. So what we wanted was um, super high-rise building and very compact. And these were all the requirements that we went through the international design competition. And um, we we're very lucky that uh, we were able to get uh, a very young group of people that had uh, very interesting visions that brought in the uh, work, live, play concept into the entire project itself. Uh, though it was very risky investing in a very young team, but I think that uh, from a public housing perspective, you know, the project need to be of quality, affordability, so cost was very much a key consideration. But the dynamic, human dynamics of working together, we were able to overcome a lot of these issues. And therefore, the innovation that came out from what uh, Peng Peng Belinda had said were, were, were able to be realized, uh, basically, in this building. Is this, a, this is obviously a very non-traditional approach, yes, a very, I would very think. Non is there anything in Singapore like this? No, it's one of its only kind. And, uh, and one of the things I wanted to point out about it was uh, when you consider the fact that you're dealing with 755-story buildings, that's like 350, 400 floors all told. Did you ever think about that? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, probably yeah. did. <laughs> you know, four, 400 floors of public housing, uh, which that in itself, and, and then uh, making an atmosphere where people can live, and some of the illustrations that we have uh, show the rooftop of this building, and I think what really caught my attention is the way that the configuration of the building was kind of lined out in this, in this question mark or this kind of curved, uh, the, the sinuous form. What, there are gardens and, and outdoor spaces here, but what did this really give you an opportunity to do? The, when there's so many units coming together, um, and each unit having a share of the public space, um, we are able then to leverage off the the high number of uh, units to actually create interesting uh, new public facilities. And the sky bridges themselves, if they were actually smaller, pro if it was a smaller project, it would be much harder to realize because you know, it was costly. But when it was shared amongst uh, 1,848 uh, uh, units, then the cost per unit became much less. And that gave us the, you know, the sort of financial impetus to then dream a little bit and the sky the sky gardens um, now form a very dramatic uh, imagination for the for the people so when this was brought onto the market you know everyone was really uh, you know they caught up and we had uh, 6000 people trying to apply for just you know uh, 1800 uh, units um, and up in the in the on the sky gardens, we had fantastic views of the whole city. Um, originally, we thought that you know it would be very, it might be very noisy and very crowded and all that. But upon you know completion of construction, we found that actually it became a very tranquil, you know, quiet space that you can get away from, you know, in the city. So I think that was a pleasant surprise uh, for us that uh, the project. Um, instead of being really uh, crowded and dense, but it, it feels open, it feels light, and it feels quiet in, in a way because of all, all these uh, communal spaces and all the greenery. And the wonderful thing, wonderful thing about the sky bridges is that you don't have to go from the 40th floor of this building downstairs to the elevator, walk over here, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then go up again. You can take a more direct path yeah. to it. Um, the, the sky bridges themselves are, are pretty wide, aren't they? Yeah, they're as wide as the building. As wide as the building, and, and they come in at what levels? 26 and 50. 26 and 50. Um, the garden spaces below or at the foot of the building, uh, tell me more about those. Um, what did you have an opportunity to do there? Well, well um, I think, I think just a little bit of background on the public housing. So all public housing in Singapore, the ground floor 
or what we call the first story, is is also called the void deck. It means it's just an open space, and that's that's actually given back to uh, the residents to use as a communal space. So. Um, what we've done here is because you have such a small site, high density, so, so um, the biggest um, issue that we need to deal with is actually the car parking that we normally would not have to deal with in a lower density site. So we have 1,100 car parks and at the same time we wanted to give back a green space. As, as a communal space other than the 26th and the 50th story. Um, so what we did was we did almost like a land peel. So we did a little mound. So created the E deck, which then stitched back into the city. So people could just from the streets sort of ramp up or step up onto our third story E deck. And below that would be the car parking and the loading and loading and, and all the servicing will be done below that. So, so now what happens is that the complete green uh, uh, um, fabric, right, is now given back to the residents. And also because it's public building, it's also for the public. So anybody else in the city will then gain an extra bit of a park. And there are connections here, I read, to transit and to uh, public transportation. Yeah. The directly. connections are really just like, because what we did was appeal. So we just basically stitched it back to the road, to the key connections that, that you could have direct um, connections to the transit. And most importantly, is it's stitched to a linear park, which is part of the city. So really, it just becomes a larger volume, a larger area of parkland for the, for the people in the city, because we're so close to um, uh, the business district. So we also envisage people who take the lunches and they can they can come over here as well. Lawrence, tell me who the clients or who the uh, residents of this building are. This is public housing. Yes. Who are they typically? Typically, they will be young couples. Uh, for this project, they're mostly young couples. So what they do is, uh, again, the objective of this project to revitalize the entire neighborhood. So bringing young couples back into this whole district itself. So what this project has successfully done is bring Five, 6,000 young people back into this area, revitalizing it, um, giving it more dynamic. You know? I think uh, we in America might think of public housing in a different way. Uh, who, who are the typical residents of public housing in Singapore? They are people who are employed. Yeah, yeah middle income group. We cater to the middle income group to as far as down as to, the, uh, to less uh, fortunate people as well. And what, what is the history of, of public housing in Singapore up until now? Uh, because obviously this is a big draw. Was this, uh, was, was drawing younger people, a younger demographic into an area always an aim of public housing or was it just more of an attitude that they were gonna service people who needed it? Yes, uh, we are a 50 year old organization. We started off because of a fire in one of our villages, much alike Chicago itself. So there was a desperate call to quickly house a lot of people in a very short time. So we started off by building in the 1960s almost 50,000 flats you know, to house all these people. And we have grown ever since. Huh? You know, our demographics are generally um, middle income group, young, um, young couples. And we have even as um, that age in place, the elderly as well. So from uh, income level, we have from the middle income group right until the low income level as well. So we have uh, most of our properties, uh, about 95% are sole properties, but we have about 5% which are rental, and these rental are for low income group. So we do take care of those who are less fortunate right up to the middle income group level. Okay, so 95% of your homes are owned, are actually yes. owned by people. Okay, and that's an interesting distinction to make. And 80% of the population actually live in public housing. Yeah. So it's not a, a rental-based uh, system, but an ownership-based system. So, um, and it's a value-driven system as well. So the um, Housing and Development Board would come back after years to 
uh, look at uh, renewal and upgrading and they look after the entire life cycle of the project. So for example, if you bought a flat uh, years ago, it would cost 50000 but today it could cost up to 400000 or even up to a million dollars for some who are closer to the city. So the, the people actually are investing in the kind of asset that the government uh, helps them to acquire through uh, loan structures that are tied in with their income. Yeah, so uh, they look after the financial, they look after the social uh, networks. networks and social distribution, uh, income distribution, uh, and of course the physical environment. So I think you know this triple bottom line is uh, considered right all the way through the entire system. Inside the building, what's it like? Inside the building, um, the units themselves are very interesting because we are only dealing with 1,000 square feet of uh, floor space. Um, we have actually tried to make it as efficient as possible. We cluster all the toilets and all the bath area, uh, make it very workable. And in the living spaces, we have um, worked with the engineer to keep the columns in the periphery. In fact, the columns and the facade panels are actually integrated. integrated and that allows the entire interior space to be then, um, you know, renovations and all that could take place. It became like a universal space that people could adjust according to their own family needs. But um, I think we also saw that, you know, the people who, who buy t these units can actually grow and depending on their use, they can actually then start to morph their units because at 1,000 uh, square feet of, of space, you have a three-bedroom unit, right? But you could start off as a young family, you can make it into a large studio and then grow back into your three-bedroom should you need that. Well, you mentioned something uh, that we don't often hear about uh, public housing, and that is that residents were given a choice of what exterior facades they wanted to use. <laughs> and you know, choice, again, in America is not something that's necessarily associated with public housing, but of course, it's an entirely different context, and you alluded to that earlier. Yeah. Um, yes. and, and that and the building materials that you used. Um, tell me about that. Some of the building materials you used were also recyclable or reclaimed, is that right? Coming back to the housing option, okay. why it's very important is because uh, affluence uh, our, our demographics, our target dem demographics has been becoming more affluent. So because of that, people want choices, you know. So that's where we respond to them, by giving our customers choices in types of, not only the uh, unit size, unit layout, you know, but also even now the facade itself. Yeah. I think this was the first project that we started giving choices in terms of uh, facade layout look. Actually, it's interesting that you brought that one out because one of our original ideas was was a true choice. Because when we talk about plug-ins, right? When we mention plug-ins, one of our original concepts was really truly you could could say that's my unit, but I don't want a balcony. I just want a bay window. But of course, you know, as as we moved along and we worked with with HDB, it, it got a little bit logistically challenging to do that. But yes, as what Lawrence has just said, it's the first um, in, in HDB development that, that you could see families coming in. It's fantastic at the show flat and they go like, oh, this one has a balcony, mom. And you talk, you know, we talk about Malay families with their elderly parents and they're very proudly trying to describe um, the unit that, you know, would you prefer a bay window or a balcony or a planter? And, and that, that was, that was really quite enjoyable when, when, we, when we were watching them do that. And that's a big thing in high density housing to be able to offer a choice like that. The, the construction uh, regimen for something like this, since a lot of this was plug in, was that easier on a project like this or what was the level of difficulty in, in constructing this? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we worked together very closely on this. The original concept that uh, Belinda uh, created, giving people all the choice in the world. <laughs> That's where, where, that, where it came down to construction and buildability itself. There was a major issue on that, you know. So uh, what we did together was work, we worked together to come up with seven types of look and feel, you know, uh, so that at the end of the day, the building could be built within cost. So, and then we tried 
to work as close as possible so that the vision, their vision of that fluid line for the building itself is maintained as much as possible. And in the choosing prefabrication, uh, HDB had uh, actually created a technology centre to research into prefabrication and we didn't realise that actually they have um, you know, acquired quite a lot of knowledge in this when we first designed the building during the competition. Um, but when we started the implementation phase, we realised that they could actually do exactly what we imagined, create these modules in three dimensions, including your balconies and your planters and whatnot, and then recombine them exactly like you would in you know, like a Lego tower or something like that. And then we started to streamline um, this process to look at how we can minimise the number of modules allow the modules to be liftable with a crane, with a, with a normal crane, um, and retain its structural uh, integrity. Within the facade panels, we created uh, slots for rainwater downpipes uh, and how we could maintain that over the years. And uh, Lawrence uh, designed the beams and the columns within the facade panels. So it, was, it became more than we had envisaged. We had originally thought of columns, you know, like a Corbusian domino uh, diagram. It was the, the floor panels and the column and then the facade. But, you know, we then merged the columns and the facade together and the beams. <laughs> so uh, the, the panels went up and then the planks and all that. So the, it was like a tube construction then very uh, different from how we imagined it. And that became an expression of the architecture as well. So it became an integrated system. Uh, the co co concrete, of course, was a very, very high-grade concrete, um, even uh, blast-proof and earthquake-proof to a certain degree. So very, very interesting. How many uh, design concepts did you go through until you finally came out with this layout? Okay, we're going to do seven 55-story <laughs> buildings. How are we going to lay these out, and how are we going to integrate them? I think we lost count. <laughs> Really, truly, we lost count because the the number of massing models we did, uh, I don't know, it was just like do and chug, do and chug. I think we could probably fill this whole table with it. You know? What were some of the other things that you looked at just for amusement? What else, <laughs> what else were you, what, what other things were on the table? Actually, the, the first thing that we did was to, to go around to the existing estates uh, because you know, it's the first of its kind in, in Singapore, really. You, you, you haven't seen um, in, in not just public housing, in private housing as well, to have a 50-story um, um, residential block. So um, we just had to go and, and sit down in one of these estates and try to Im imagine what 50 stories meant. So one of the, the things that we set the, the brief within the brief, if, 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 if I may say, if, my, if I may call it, was to set some parameters for our design. I think one of them was um, the overlooking issue. So the idea that if you go really, really tall, then you don't, don't want to be hemmed in by the blocks and you want to have distant views. So light and air, maximum light and air and no um, block to block face, minimize the block to block facing was one of those things that we set uh, ourselves to do. So when we did started working on all these massing models, um, we kept to these parameters as well. So when we did assess um, any one of these models was based on that as well. Visual porosity, we also talk about visual porosity yes. and exposure to western sun. In the tropics, the western sun is, uh, uh, we have to protect our buildings against the western sun because it exposed the, uh, the units uh, and the glass to great heat gain. Um, and I think uh, the layout of the tower blocks arise out of... Um, trying to answer all of these parameters the best possible. Um, and we also try to spin the models around to make sure that we had visual porosity through the block to avoid a, a canyon or um, a wall-like feel. So when we did that, we were very happy that we could answer all of these very uh, demanding parameters, including the conservation of all the old trees on site. So our buildings had to avoid the trees, 
create visual connections with existing buildings, uh, you know, face away from the sun, face away from one another to get more views. And we just tested and tested and we are just very happy that we found this solution before time <laughs> became <laughs> red I think the quality for the project itself, the fact that it is so dense, yet, but yet the residents have a view. Every resident has a view of uh, the uh, neighbourhood. And you know, uh, we, when you think about super dance, you, you open your window and you can see your neighbour. This is not the case. Every unit has a spectacular view of the city itself. And that was why he mentioned the visual porosity of this project is amazingly astute. Yeah. So now, Lawrence, you have raised the bar. And now uh, everyone in Singapore is envying this, uh, this housing block. Right. So you've raised expectations. <clears throat> so what happens now? What are the future developments going to look like? Um, Future developments, we have started looking at uh, our talented architectural firms. Uh, we have taken a lot of learning points from this project. Uh, we have incorporated a lot of these learning projects into our future projects as well. Um, again, some of the things that uh, Ping Ping has mentioned is the virtual greenery. You know, we've uh, vertical greenery. Vertical greenery. Uh, the common spaces for people to socialize and to create community bonds. Those are very, very important things that we as public housing has taken from this project and moved on. Yeah. Even um, creation of energy, solar panels, um, rainwater harvesting, so becoming more sustainable, more expressive uh, architecturally. I think originally uh, the pragmatics of production drove drove the development, uh, you needed speed, you needed repetitions. I think today, uh, different kinds of expression, I think uh, different types of uh, flats and the diversity of housing. I think the focus is starting to shift to perhaps the art of housing as compared with the, you know, the production of the pragmatics of housing. I, I think the way HGV has started, um, I mean, Lawrence talked about the fire and it's out of need when people are homeless. But right now, 50 years down the road, you're talking about a different group of people, people who are, like what Lawrence said, they're a lot more affluent. And um, they're looking for something deeper than just something, a shelter for themselves, right? So what, what, I, you know, what I think and what I see in, in what's come out of Duxton is that also Lawrence can correct me, but I also see that as one of the first projects where the residents had, they, had, it, they were so hyped up about the project that they created their own blog while the construction was happening. That's how much, how connected they were to the project and how proud of it they were. I mean, blogs were going on about, oh, my unit's coming up soon. I can see it moving. And, and they, they, they had their photographs uploaded onto the blogs about how the blogs were starting to, to get built. And, oh, we can't wait. It's going to happen soon. So, and, and that's something that you don't see in the other housing estates. So, so we, we like to think that what we um, brought to, to these new set of owners is something that they truly love as well, not just, you know, it's my home, I own it, it's gone beyond ownership, it's something else now. Well, I want to say congratulations on the award because it's an amazing accomplishment and the pinnacle at Duxton is the uh, 2010 winner of the Council's Best Hall Building Award for Asia and Australia and thank you for coming to Chicago and seeing us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>